we've gone from talking about like our jobs as um, leadership developers by day and, you know, how we have to show that we're, we're making this impact, this ROI. And then from there, we've kind of transitioned into if you want to just advance your career, you want to mm-hmm. quantify your contribution to the team. And it's got to be more than just proving you kept your nose clean and didn't get fired for 10 years. Like it's sure. really be in the 10 years you've been paying me. Uh, I've saved you this much money while also producing this kind of revenue or producing this kind of result. And when you show that kind of quantifiable, verifiable uh history, mm-hmm. then that opens you up for more growth. And, uh, and so those are the kinds, and you want to do this, even if you're not just going after, it, it, you know, you're not going after a promotion, your annual performance review. This is a great sure. thing to bring that up. If you do quarterly conversations with your boss, bring this up. This is what I've done in the last quarter. This is what I'd like to do in the next quarter to drive your needle forward for your strategy and your vision and your goals, uh, you know, like volunteer stuff for your leader to, to, to move that needle for the, your leader. Um, so that's definitely something to, to be open to. Um, I, I feel like the theme for this talk, um, I'll have to cut this out so people don't know, let's think we planned it the whole time, uh, is you know how do you advance your career? Like what are some practical steps to advance your career? And so that'd be one, showing your ROI to the organization um, for your own growth, but also you know to open up more doors for for growth in the organization. So sure. more leadership opportunities, more promotion sure. opportunities, that kind of thing. Um, because they don't just, I'm, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I'm wondering what is the, the, the duration, the average duration that a person has with an organization now? Uh, it's there used to be, there, three years or less now. Probably about three years or less. Right. Yeah. And so that reminds me of my time in the military. Right. So every duty station, every, uh, you know, change of assignment, was about three to four years. Yeah. And so my goal for each of those duty stations, when I when I was assigned to a new base or I had a new uh, type of responsibility, was at the end of the year, what is my performance evaluation going to look like? And the more impact I made, the better the performance evaluation. Yeah. And so I encourage employees to put themselves in that mindset. Like if I only had two years in this department, right? Two years with this organization, even though, even though you may stay there for five, six, seven years, but we know the average is about three. If I say, okay, what do I want to accomplish in the next two years? Not that I just want to come to work every day and just do these processes, do these tasks that are assigned to me, but what kind of influence do I want to have? What kind of change do I want to see? What kind of impact do I want to have? It's like goal setting, right? This is what I want to accomplish in the next two years. Start working towards those goals and think about how you want your evaluation to read at the end of the year. And that's when you quantify everything that you've done. Um, I worked with a, a, a guy uh, just recently who um, he's a military background as well. Uh, I hired a, a former army officer, very uh, logistical thinking, very analytical. And uh, every time each week I'd go into his office, we'd have these conversations and he had a, a word document up on his, on his um, computer. And he was just basically typed out, every new thing he did in the previous week. So mm-hmm. not necessarily the the typical tasks that he did, but the new things, like if I improved our, our, our website, um, if I uh, found a, a quicker way to process um, a vendor uh, payment. Um, and, and if you're always on the go, looking for ways to improve things, a couple of things happen. When they're looking for someone to elevate to that next level. You're not trying to prepare yourself. You're already prepared. Exactly. You're already, you're already demonstrating to your leadership and to your organizations, you know, C-suite that you're doing the work that it takes to fulfill that next role. And I, what I see too many people do nowadays is they won't take that extra step and that extra initiative because they're not in the seat at that moment. Like, well, why should I worry about improvement? That's, the superintendent's role or that's to the director's role. Yeah. But if you take ownership over the improvement, when that director's role becomes available, you make it hard for them to deny you that opportunity to take that, that position. Exactly. And, and you can have a skin, a piece of skin in the game, uh, uh, like to do the work or the prep work to hand off to your leader, to go take care of the thing that needs to get taken care of. Uh, so you're not like stepping on toes politically or anything. Um, 
one of the things I was just thinking about, oh, two things really, uh, because you know we're talking about preparing. Like it's the uh, oh man, I, I have so many analogies I want to use at the same time. But and, you know the facing the giants just popped in my head, and the story about the two farmers, right? The the one that they both they're going through a drought. Uh, every morning, both farmers wake up and they pray for rain. And you know, mm-hmm. dear God, you know, please make it rain today. Let's grow some crops. Let's make, let's let's bring bread to the the masses. All that good stuff. Uh, and then after that prayer, one prayer would sit back down on the porch and wait for the rain. Uh, the other farmer would go to the barn, hook up the plow, go out to the field and plow the field and prepare it. Uh, and then check the seeds to make sure there are plenty of seeds and check the soil and, and you know, do I need to get more fertilizer, all that stuff. Uh, and then so the question at the end of this analogy is, which of the two farmers was prepared to receive the rain God was going to send? And, you know, it's the same thing you're talking about. You're, you're sure. wanting to move forward in your career. Um, what is it you're doing to prepare yourself for that next level? And one of the uh, two things that pop into my mind is uh, the first one is a simple one. Uh, don't dress for the job you have dress for the job you want. Right. And, uh, and I, I find myself not consistently fulfilling that. Like there are times where I dress like an executive at work. And then there are times where I'm like, I don't feel like it. I just want to fit in with everybody else. And I take the jacket <laughs> off, I take the tie off and, and my boss does a double take cause he's a vice president. And, uh, but then there are days where I just throw the jacket on no tie, just the jacket. And he's like, and it throws them off, which tells me, Jerry, you went on too long without dressing up for the part. Uh, now that you dressed up for the part, you've kind of scared him. He thinks you're interviewing for other jobs. So wear that the jacket more too. often. Yeah. yeah. And, and so it's like, just wear the jacket more often, Jerry. And, 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 you know, the executives start thinking you're one of them. And then they start thinking of you for projects and, and things like that, because you, you just have this presence about you. Um, the other way to, I, prepare, I, Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I've had that happen where um, so it, routine, every once in a while, I'll wear a suit to work. And then you'll have, they'll have that one day you wear a suit and your boss sees you. And you're like, is everything okay? I'm like, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why you're wearing a suit? I'm yeah. Like, I, I wasn't at a job interview this morning. Don't worry about it. I'm okay. <laughs> Not going anywhere. Uh, yeah. I, I told my boss the other day, cause I, I keep a jacket. So I, you know, fan of the office and, and uh, some of the tips I learned about corporate life is, you know, from the office, like you always keep a jacket on the back of your chair because when your boss walks by early in the morning and they see your jacket, like, wow, Jerry came in he's early. <laughs> You're not even there yet. You're coming at eight or nine o'clock like everybody else. Uh, or you could be like George Costanza and just leave your broken down car outside of the office. Right. <laughs> and then, wow. He's really pulling the hours. Uh, just push it into a different parking spot every <laughs> every couple of days uh and then you know leave your jacket there because then they'll walk by at the end of the day when they're leaving like wow jerry's still in the building somewhere you know that guy's really burning the midnight oil well you know this week this past week i decided well why don't i just wear the jacket you know and actually play the part and and so i did and my boss was like wow you're all dressed up and snazzy and i'm like and I had some appointments that day, you know, that week, that day, <laughs> there were medical appointments. I'm like, uh, it's cool. It was truly a physical exam. That's where I was going. And it's like, Oh, okay, good. I'm like, yeah, Hey, I know. I, I love my job. Uh, so th- that was the first thing though, dress for the job you want, not the job you have. Uh, the second thing though, that you can prepare yourself to receive that rain in a sense. Um, you know, if your company has prescribed, competencies, behavior competencies, mm-hmm. you know, most folks look at those as just things you got to go through during the annual performance review. But seriously, and this is advice I got from my previous director before I came to my current job. Uh, she said, take a look at the competencies, not for the employer supervisor, Jerry, because you're an informal leader. Why don't you take a look at the competencies for manager slash director? Pick one to develop and go from there. Right. And I looked at it and it was different. Like the, the competencies were way different. I, some of them I was already doing, uh, but then there was one around uh, communication, communicating effectively uh, and talked about being concise and clear and casting vision. And I, and I asked her, what about that one? And she said, that's the one you want. Cool. And so we focused on like executive presence and how to talk in a meeting uh, and knowing my personality. So like using my wackiness in a meeting, but then also knowing when to tamper it down, be quick, concise, sure. point out and move on. Um, I was promoted to a manager within like six months of that advice. Um, and I was consistently every week getting feedback on how I was doing with that and never once asked her like, Hey, when are you going to promote me? When are you going to promote me? It was just like, there was a reorganization that came 
And I was thought of first, not just by her, but the other directors in the department and the vice president thought Jerry would be perfect for that role. Let's, let's see how he does. And so, I mean, the point I'm making there is I prepared myself for that role by looking at what is the next level of competencies and how can I grow to those competencies, right? not just sit on my laurels for the current ones. The, the challenge with most people is they want to prepare themselves for the salary, not, yeah. necessarily, not necessarily for the responsibility, right? Exactly. So, so, so I, I, <laughs> I see, because uh, my office is in human resources. Um, and, so I'll too, see, yeah. and so I'll see, you know, you, you talk to the recruiters once in a while and um, you're looking at different executive level positions that are being posted and, and you'll see like some of the applicants and you're like, what? uh where you know i i i appreciate the boldness but they don't meet any of the minimum requirements <laughs> exactly, uh, yeah and, and so you want you want to you know uh but but i think what happens is uh, people will see that salary and they're like hey why not i'm gonna apply for it um but what i don't see a lot of people do is prepare for the responsibility and so uh, and it, it's like this in any any new job especially for first first time supervisors new managers First thing they do when they get offered the promotion, they start pulling out the calculator and they want to know what that next paycheck is going to look like. Yeah. But do they, do they look at how many people am I now responsible for? Uh, how, how large is this budget? What other pain comes along with, with this position? Yeah. Um, and, what's my and, leadership and, credo going to be? What's yeah. What's and, and who now do I have? Sometimes it's nice to not be so close to certain levels of leadership. Right. Because you didn't realize that person above you was often a buffer between right. you and that top <laughs> leader. So now all of a sudden you don't have that buffer anymore. And so that that you might have had that one leader or director that was sort of shielding you from some of the harshness that comes uh, be, with being in that leadership role. And, and people, a lot of people want to be leaders. And I appreciate that. But it's an unfair endeavor. Right. Yeah. It's oh, not, yeah. It's not it's not puppy dogs and roses. And sometimes it's. Uh, oftentimes it's harder days more than it is good days. Yeah. And so what I encourage people to do is if you want to do that next level, if you want to move up to that next step, don't just prepare yourself and look at, oh, the reason I, why I want to be at that next level is because I want to take care of people. Or the reason I really want to be at that next level is because the salary is better. You really want to take a closer look and see what does it really take? What are the, what are the things that I'm not seeing? Um, the extra hours, the the phone calls in the middle of the evening. And I'm not saying this to scare people from trying to step up and take on uh, new roles, new responsibilities, but there's a lot that goes with it. It's not yeah. always as easy as, it th as most people see. Yeah. Nothing's more exciting than taking the responsibility for somebody else's mistake, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not even talking to my own, my own people. I'm talking about like another department makes a mistake and somehow <laughs> it's my fault. I'm like, what? No, I'm not even a I don't even well, do or, that job. Like, or, or if you, me? or if you just, or if you just taken on the new role, yeah. And there was a failure three months ago in that department, <laughs> and yeah. you're, and you're the one. Why did this happen? Like, I, I don't know. I wasn't here then, but you still have to, uh, yeah. in some ways, take ownership for correcting that problem. So oh, exactly. you can't just use the the new guy excuse forever. Exactly. I think uh, so. Another way of growing our career. So we've already talked about. Um, you know, upskilling, you know, quantifying your, your contribution, looking at what you're doing in terms of quantifiable ROI type of perspective, as opposed to just, I show up and I don't get fired. Uh, we talked about, you know, growing yourself for the next level. So dress the part, uh, learn the competencies and the skills of the next level and stepping up and, and meeting the challenge of what's needed for the organization, for your leader and so on. Um, what would you say is another way to, to grow yourself for the next level? I will say this, and it's it's sort of a biblical viewpoint. Be the salt and light, right? Be that person that's dependable. Be that person that in a pinch, they can go to you. And when they do go to you, you're going to have the great attitude about it. Uh, you're going to be that person that you feel like you pick the right person to go to in a pinch. Yeah. Because um, it's easy to, oh, they're always messing up and they're always relying on me. Well, if you're going to have that bad attitude when when your leadership comes to you for an emergency, if you're going to have the negative attitude, the um, just sort of sour puss, oh, they're always bothering me about this, then they may be preparing you for that next level and what to expect. So if you're going to have a negative attitude when they're giving you these short notice taskings, 
uh, short notice uh, emergency situations, then they're probably not going to look at you for a permanent role in a leadership development uh, capacity. So that's that's why I, you know, my, you know, you and I are both, you know, uh, share Christian values. And so we're probably the annoying ones at work, Jerry, where we're there early every morning, smiles on our faces. Uh, but we want to know that we want people to know that um, you can have a great attitude at work and you can be that dependable person at work. And even when things are bad and even if things are <clears throat> not going the way it should be, your attitude will get you through that that tough time better than a bad attitude will. Yes. And oh, so, yeah. so, so dressing the part, building up your, your resume, so to speak, as far as, you know, quantifying what you do, find problems and solve those problems that maybe the leadership doesn't even recognize as a problem. And then also, again, be that salt and light, be that person that people are willing to go to when there's a need. Yeah. And I think a, a great example of being that salt and light, you know, that, that person you could be dependent on, um, you know, it's, you ever come across somebody where you ask them a question, like, so you're at somebody else's restaurant or somebody else's store and you're asking a question like, Hey, what's the price of this? Or, Hey, um, you know, is this thing on sale? And the person responds to you with, I don't know, or, Hey, that's <laughs> not, that's not what I do here. And yeah. that's it. That's yeah. the end of the transaction and off they go. And you're like, the worse. ah, man, but I still need help if I'm going to use this business to help me do the thing I need to do. And if you get enough of those people who are like, well, I don't know. And then that's it. They offer nothing beyond, I don't know, or that's not my job or no, we don't do that. Um, that's a lot of loss for that organization. And, uh, and, you know, again, showing value, you don't necessarily have to be the person that does the thing that's being asked, right? Uh, at least find out who the person is and, and communicate to the person. So you set expectations as well. Uh, because I mentioned earlier as a joke, like my department gets blamed for things that we don't even do. Like that's not even our responsibility area. And we just launched an ERP and I kid you not, if I had an email, no, if I had a dollar for every email I got that blamed my department for something else, somebody else is responsible for. Right. I'd be taking out a lot of people to lunch to celebrate the presentation <laughs> of this thing. And, and so it's and, like, and for, and for the listeners, ERP, uh, enterprise resource planning. So it's right. a software system that integrates your human resources, finances, and supply chain all together into one system. There you go. So your leadership can actually run analytics much faster and make decisions that are data driven as opposed to just based on hunches or old information from reports. Um, so that's an ERP. Um, so anyway, yeah, you know, we, we would just get an email or a phone call that blamed us for something every single day. Sure. And, you know, we could just simply say, hey, sorry, you got the wrong department. That's not us. And leave it at that. Uh, I think something that has distinguished our department from other teams and other departments is we will actually connect that person. Like, we'll let them know, hey, you know, our department actually does not handle that. We never send that email out. That's not us. Um, but I think I know who does. Let me find out who it is. Let me connect the two of you together uh, and give me some more information so I can set this up with the other sure. person. And within 30 minutes or an hour or the next day, um, there is now a meeting between the two parties that really need to have the meeting and a solution is made. And when it's all said and done, the person who started all this and blamed me or my team for the problem turns around and says, thank you so much. That's exactly right. What now they don't go off and like, set the record straight from all the other people that they blamed. And so it's kind of up to me to kind of go back out there and, and fix the branding of the department. And, and I'll go through my VP for that. I'm like, Hey, you know, we, we just did this, this, and this for so-and-so. Uh, but you're aware that they blamed us as if we were the problem. And he goes, Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll make sure people up there know. Uh, and, and so we do a little bit of damage control in that respect, but we never go out there and get defensive. We don't cut them off. We don't right. say you're dead to me for blaming me. Like none of that happens. We know that they're frustrated. And, and so there's that detachment, like knowing that we're, we're like, it's not a personal attack on me. Uh, the person needs help and they've been getting bounced around before they got to us. And so let's just help them. And so I think that's the big difference maker and being the salt and light is not, uh, blowing them off saying, uh, that's not my job. Good luck. It's being the salt and light at work is, Hey, you know, that isn't what I do, but let me see if I can help find the person who can. Right. Um, yeah. You know, especially in a hospital system, like where, where you work at, um, when you, when you think who the ultimate customer is, 
right? So you have your yeah. internal customers, right? You have those departments, you have the nursing staff, the biomedical, you probably have facility management staff, um, radiology staff. <clears throat> they, I don't know if you have oncology or anything like that, yeah. but they are routinely dealing with frustrated um, clients and customers, right? People are hurting people. And so sometimes they'll take and, and I'm speaking from experience because I, I worked medical for a lot of years in the military and um, they may take whatever issues they're having out on you because you, you're you in that safe locked behind HR closed doors. You don't I, deal yeah. with the front line like they do. <laughs> and so and so it's easy for them to get frustrated because they're they're trying they may be trying to save someone's life you know, and, and they're, they're frustrated because they're not able to do that. And so it's just, it's about having empathy with people as well. Right. Um, I ran a, um, my, one of my last duty stations in the military, I was in the medical group and part of my responsibility was running the hospital dining hall. And oh, you're like, yeah, wow. you're like, yeah, it can't be stressful. And I'm like, and, and what I would, what I would tell the staff, um, those frontline staff, the cashiers, the servers, um, the, the folks that serve the food is, you're dealing with doctors who probably just gave someone a terminal diagnosis. You're dealing with family members who are coming through to get something to eat because they're stressed out and they just, maybe their family member just received that terminal diagnosis. I said, it's our job not to just put food on a plate. It's not our job to just exchange money for, for food, but our job is to be that, that smiling face, that caring, uh, having that caring attitude <clears throat> and, and treating everyone, regardless if they come to us, disgruntled or angry um who knows what they just experienced five minutes before walking into our our um our area yeah so it's our job to make sure that we are presenting ourselves at our best and and being empathetic to whatever they just went through whatever that is and i you know i, I my current my current position we have a lobby right before you go into hr because <clears throat> hr is one of those um, um areas in our building that's locked behind closed doors so there is a lobby area and every time I walk through that that lobby area, and if I see someone in the waiting room, even though they're not here for me, because usually the folks in that waiting room are here to meet with one of the recruiters, I'm not recruiting, but I'll always ask the question, have you been helped yet? Has someone, yeah. we do have a receptionist, but there are times when that receptionist may not be at the desk at that moment. And so I don't want that person sitting there coming, you know, seeing people go in and out and they're just kind of like, is someone going to help me or not? And so just taking that that two seconds to go, hey, uh, have you been helped yet? Um, because here's what I, I include myself in this one category that receives more hate and more punishment and more um, just sort of bloodlust than any other category. And that category is they. Oh, yeah. Those guys. The, 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 those guys. <laughs> they. they. They're horrible. Right? They. It's always they, right? It's always that office. It's always yeah. they. They told so, me. They did this. They did that. They created this policy. They created this, um, you know, this mess. <clears throat> and one of the things I talk about with our uh, brand new employees when they come to work for the city or municipal government is welcome to they. So regardless of where you work in the city, you are part of they. Yeah. So it's important for you to represent they to the best of your abilities. So regardless of, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so regardless of where you work, right? You, you could be the person that works streets. You could be the person that's working sewage systems, or you could be that person that gets to sit behind a nice desk and sit in a nice air conditioned room. You need to represent at all times that you are re representing, not just yourself, yeah. but you're representing the entire enterprise. That would be an awesome t-shirt, by the way. We are they. Just, yes. We are that they. Capital letters. And then like the city <laughs> logo up there in the <laughs> upper left. And, and maybe it's on the back. We are they. <laughs> uh, but whatever it is. I mean, talk about like team, a spree decor culture. Yeah. Like, we all understand we are they. Like when our residents are mad, they're talking about us. Yeah. And we got to change their attitude about us and let them say they're awesome. And, you know, they fix well, our roads. And, and, and I talk about that too with first term <laughs> supervisors, right? With first term leaders, first term managers yeah. is welcome to they. Because the people that are underneath you uh, who who are looking for support or looking for answers and reassurance, they will throw the management team into one category, yeah. the they category. So, Jerry, you and I are going to write a book called Welcome to They. Yeah. And it's going to be – yeah. It's going to be about how to uh, turn they into a positive. Uh, there, there's a whole workshop series off this, by the way. 
coaching. Did you just that you just created just like two seconds ago, or I'm jotting it down right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to they. Boom. They. And we Copy, copyright beyond the bar. They yes, on this day, at this time we we came up with this. Nice. Nice, nice. All right. Well, we're almost out of time. Um, now, for, you guys just been listening to us, and maybe I said it in the intro. Who knows? Um, maybe I forgot when I do the intro. Uh, but Scott, by the way, has been on the show three times already, and this is now officially put, he he wanted to get in the lead of most appearances on Beyond the Rut. He has finally achieved it, guys. Uh, so Scott Green, he's from LlamaLeadership.com. Uh, he's part of the show called the Llama Lounge, and both of our shows are part of the Lima Charlie network, which you can find more about at Lima Charlie network.com. And if you're like, what is Lima Charlie? Uh, well, in military terms, it, it stands for loud and clear. I, I hear you Lima Charlie. Uh, so radio talk basically. Um, so if you ever want to sound cool, like hey, I hear you Lima Charlie, yeah, <laughs> you can do that guys. All right. Uh, so Scott, any final words of wisdom for these folks before we head out? Sure. Uh, first of all, so I'm in the lead now. Is it is it official? You are officially, yeah. You beat Sarah McDaniel. So I'm going to email okay. Sarah and say, "Hey, Sarah, no, you've no, only no. been on three times. Yeah, it's been on four. When do you want to come back on?" And I like I like I like a, I like, a dom- I like a dominant performance. So we'll have to do this again very very soon. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I want a strong lead. I want a strong lead. There you yeah. Go. So check check out Beyond the Rut. Check out uh, the Llama Lounge podcast and the Llama Leadership website where we have. Uh, weekly blogs we have uh, access to our podcast all kinds of other nuggets and uh check out the lima charlie network which uh beyond the rut is a part of the llama lounge podcast is a part of and we have other uh military um affiliated uh veterans and uh, military supporters that uh have their own podcasts that are part of that network and every day you get something different a new a new episode each day from one of our uh, affiliates nice there you go all right everybody